I'm going to say some very hard things today. Now, they're not hard for those of us who have taken the time over a period of years to prove all things from the Bible. They're going to be hard for those who have are new to our church. They're going to be hard for those who have not completely given their lives to Jesus Christ because these will be new things. Remember one time Jesus said, you must eat of his body and drink of his blood. He was referring to the Passover. They didn't understand what he was saying, and they said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? So they turned away from him. And nobody but the original disciples who became the apostles and a few others continued to follow him. So the things I'm going to say today, I hope God's Spirit will impress upon you as I go through every scripture that they are true. And when you see in your own Bible, with your own eyes, they are the truth, then you, with your Christian walk from now on, will begin to live by what I say. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 to 19, notice who is doing the talking here. It's Jesus, our Savior. Verse 17 says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. And yet, you go out into the world today, in the churches, they'll say, oh no, Jesus came along, he nailed the law to the cross. You don't have to obey it anymore. He did away with it. And yet, Jesus said, don't think, and the church says, do think. Right the opposite of what Jesus said. He says, don't you dare think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but fulfill and the word fulfill means to execute it or to satisfy the righteous requirements. So Jesus came to live and make a perfect example of how to live by God's law. And yet the churches say, no, he did away with the law. We don't have to keep it anymore. The exact opposite of what Jesus said. When you read chapter 5, 6, and 7, what is Jesus doing He's not only saying you're to keep God's law, but you're to internalize it inside. You're not just to be caught in a sin if you're committing adultery, but even if you think inside of your heart to lust after the opposite sex, you're guilty. It, now, isn't that harder than if you're just caught in the act? Oh, yes, it is. Jesus said, verse 18, for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, it's perish, not one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And yet you go out and listen to the, what the churches say today. They say, no, God's law, Jesus fulfilled it, it's done away. Jesus said until there's no more earth, it's perished, disintegrated. His law will be in force. Who are we to believe? Churches or Jesus? Who's going to save you, churches or Jesus? Jesus. Verse 19, whosoever. All right, now I want you to do something personally. This is for those who are sitting in the audience today, those who are ever going to hear this cassette tape, this video. I want you to put your name in there. I will do the same. David Smith, therefore, shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so. So if I break one commandment out of God's law, and if I teach other men to break those commandments, look what it says about me. Now you put your name in there. A little distraction here. I wanted to make sure you were awake. <laughs> Notice now, it says, He shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. If I teach you, just one point of God's law is done away, and I teach you to break it and disobey it and have a lifestyle of disobedience, I'm going to be the least in the kingdom of heaven. Notice what it says, though. But in contrast, whosoever, put your own name there, shall do, that's live by them, and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Think what the contrast is. You and I have a choice right now. And if you're not asleep, you're listening to my voice. That means you have a contrast. 
You have a choice set before you today by Jesus Christ. These are His words. And if you have a red letter Bible, it'll be in red. It says you can keep His law and teach other people to do the same and you'll be great in the kingdom. Or you can teach other people just to break one point. What about doing away with all of them? That's what the churches teach. We're under grace only. You never have to do anything again. It's just grace. Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. No way. Before I'm through, I'm going to show scriptures that you cannot have grace if there is not a law to violate. And if you violate that law, you are no longer under grace until Jesus Christ administers that grace again called forgiveness. Well, you and I have a choice. We can believe and obey and teach others to do the same and we'll be great in the kingdom. Or we can break God's law, teach others they're done away, and if we make it into the kingdom, we'll be the very least. We'll be the ones who are out on the scrub detail, keeping all the, for the floors clean so that we can have Sabbath services next week. Instead of being a king and a priest ruling and reigning on this earth, Notice what else Jesus said. Now this is when he was alive. This Bible, if we believe it, was written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It is for us. It's a living book. It's for all ages. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 16 to 19, Behold, one came and said unto Jesus, I'm putting in the noun for the pronoun, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? This young man wanted to know what he could do to have eternal life. Here's Jesus' answer. This is not Dave Smith, chapter 1, verse 4. No, this is Jesus Christ. And Jesus said unto him, Why call you me good? There's none good but one, that is God. But if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. He did not say, we're under grace now. You don't have to do a thing. No, he said, keep. It is absolutely impossible for an individual to keep something without picking one foot up, put it in front of the other, and doing. You must perform in order to keep something. You can't put something in a freezer to preserve it unless you pick it up, walk across the room, and put it in there. You must perform in order to keep the commandments. Those of us who have been struggling with this flesh for the last 25, 30 years, since we've been had an understanding of God's true ways, and we've been baptized, know that it is not easy. We know that when a thought comes into our mind and we're tempted to sin, either we perform by resisting or we give in to the flesh and we become a sinner. And then we must go to the shed blood of Jesus and ask forgiveness again. Notice what Jesus said in verse 18. He said unto him, which? The young man said, look, I want to know which commandments because I want to enter into life. Jesus said, you shall do no murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. We know these come from the Ten Commandments. You can read Exodus 20 for yourself. He went right down through here and he listed several of the commandments. One of them he did not list because he knew this man's weakness he lusted for this world's goods. He coveted. He didn't list it. And then the young man said, look, these things you've list listed, I've kept all my life. And Jesus said, look, you lack one thing. Sell all you have. Give it to the poor. Come follow me. He couldn't do it. His heart was set on worldly things, the things of this life, the better home, the better car, or in those days, the better camel, whatever the transportation was, his heart was set on the flesh. The others were simple. He had done those because it didn't require him to give up his problem. In Hebrews chapter 13, there's one short verse. But it is dynamite when we understand the truth. Hebrews 13 verse 8 says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever. He has one set standard for everyone on the face of the earth. 
No one will be saved outside that set standard. Why was it that Abraham had a covenant made with him and he was called the father of the faithful? It's recorded in Genesis 26, 5. It was because Abraham obeyed God's laws, statutes, and judgments. He kept all of God's ways. And this was 430 years minimum before Jesus Christ spoke them with his own mouth from the top of Mount Sinai. Abraham kept them. That's why God made a covenant with him. He said, now I know after he was told to offer his son Isaac on the, uh, as a sacrifice, typifying Abraham as God the Father and Isaac as his son Jesus. See? God the Father was going to offer his only son. So here Abraham had no son, and it was a miracle that a woman after age gave birth to a child. And so God required Abraham to show that he was willing to even give up that one and only son so that he would obey his Savior. He did it. He became the father of the faithful. And here Jesus said, he hasn't changed. Either you and I are willing to give up anything that stands between us and Jesus Christ or we cannot enter into the kingdom of God. There will be nothing, no reservation whatsoever in our lives that prevents us from serving Jesus Christ. Now this is the same Jesus before his human birth who stated from Mount Sinai the Ten Commandments. All these are found in Exodus 20. Now what I want to do is turn back to Exodus 20. I want to show you verse 1, what it says. Because here is Jesus Christ, the same yesterday in Old Testament times, today in New Testament times, and forever, out into eternity. Here's what he says in Exodus 20, verse 1. The people were prepared, they washed themselves, and then they came up to the foot of Mount Sinai. Here's the great God of the Old Testament. He's standing there in the clouds, in the smoke. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Here is the God that brought them out of bondage as a type of our spiritual bondage in the New Testament. This same personality who brought them out said, I am the Lord your God, in verse 2, that have brought you out of the land of Egypt. Notice what else he said, and he spoke this to Moses, and Moses wrote it in a book. Chapter 23 of Exodus, verse 12. Chapter 23, this is still a part of the covenant. Verse 12, six days shall you do work, and on the seventh day you shall rest that thine ox and ass may rest, and your son of your handmaid and the stranger may be refreshed. In other words, everybody in the land, when it was a nation of Israel, was to rest. Today, every single Christian, or if you own a business, are to let your employees be off on God's Sabbath day. And we're to rest. Notice he continues in verse 14. This is a part of the covenant to Old Testament Israel. And then I'll relate it to the New Testament in just a moment. Verse 14 says three times, and the word times literally means seasons, spring, summer, and winter. You shall keep a feast unto me in the year. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded you in the time appointed in the month of Abib. That's the first month after the spring equinox when you see the little crescent in the sky. The moon, that little tiny crescent, when it moves out from behind the earth and the sun rays first hits the moon, then you know that that begins the first day of the new year in God's sight. Notice what he says now in verse 16. And the feast of, of harvest... And the first fruits of your labor, that's Pentecost in the spring of the year, which you have sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering, which is the end of the year, that's the feast of tabernacles. There's what is called holy days. In the Old Testament, that was a part of the covenant that God gave to Israel. 
You had the days of unleavened bread in the spring, and either Pentecost could be in the spring or early summer. And then you had the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles in the fall of the year. Now notice what else he goes on to say. Verse 17, Three times in the year all your males shall appear before the Lord your God. Why did he say that? Men only. Well, I'll show other scriptures that will prove that it's not just the men. It's only if, say, a woman is pregnant and it would be rough on her to travel, or if you had an abundance of livestock and there was no one to take care of it, then at least the head of the family must appear at the Feast of Tabernacles before God. And then it was his responsibility to go back and teach his family everything that he had learned. That was when they were a nation. Today we're a little different. But what I want you to see is the person who spoke these things was none other than the person that we know of as Jesus Christ. Can we prove that? It said he was the Lord God that brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of bondage. Let's turn in the New Testament to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You should burn this into your memory. Because these verses prove who the God of the Old Testament was. It was not God the Father. Jesus came and in John 1.18 said He revealed the Father. The Father had not been revealed to mankind until Jesus came. So the God of the Old Testament was Jesus Christ our Savior. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 1 to 4. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant... He wants to wipe out misunderstanding. How that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. All were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Jesus Christ, the Savior, was the great God of the Old Testament he came into human flesh, impregnated into the womb of Mary, and his name was also Emmanuel, which means God with us. So the very God who delivered and was the Savior physically of Old Testament Israel is also the Savior of the church today, spiritually instead of physically. Now let's go back to Leviticus chapter 23, because if Jesus was the Savior of the Old Testament, and then He came into the New Testament and died for our sins, and all the prophecies said that one must come and die for the people. Let's notice in Leviticus 22, verse 31 to 33. Therefore shall you keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord. All right, here's the same person that brought them out of Egypt. We identified it as Jesus Christ, our Savior, Neither shall you profane my holy name, but I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. I am the Lord which hallow you, that brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. It means eternal. Well, if this same individual says you must keep my commandments, I brought you out of the land of Egypt, this is Jesus, isn't it? Sure it is, before his human birth. Now let's go right into chapter 23, verse 1 and 2. And the Lord, we can say Jesus Christ, before his human birth, spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feast of the Lord. Here is something that are called feast, and they're Jesus Christ feasts which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my personal pronoun, feast. These are Jesus Christ feasts. They're not the feast of the Jews. They're not the feast of Israel. They are Jesus, the Christ of Almighty God's feast, our Savior. Now let's continue. I want to go into Isaiah now, chapter 43. Isaiah 43. We'll be skipping between Old and New Testament. Verse 11. 
The person in the Old Testament who was speaking was Jesus Christ. He was the God of the Old Testament. I, even I, in verse 11, am the Lord. And beside me there is no Savior. Who is the Savior of the New Testament? Jesus Christ. Right here in the Old Testament, he prophesied of himself and he said, I, even I, the Lord, the eternal, the Yahweh of the Old Testament. That was the Hebrew. And he says, I am the Savior. There's no other Savior. This absolutely proves the person in the Old Testament that was talking to Israel and prophesying was Jesus Christ. There is no Savior but him. Let's drop down to the last part of verse 14 and have brought down all the Chaldeans, oh, I'm sorry, verse uh, 15, I'm sorry. I am the Lord, your God, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Who is it that's going to return in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 through 15? And He is King of kings and Lord of lords? Jesus. Right here is absolute proof, the person from the Old Testament who became the Savior of the New Testament, is the one and same person. He's our Savior. He's our King. Now let's go to Isaiah chapter 44. Isaiah 44, verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. He's also the Redeemer. He's purchasing us back, redeeming His people from their sins. Notice what it says. I am the first and I am the last and beside me there is no God. Here is Jesus. He says he's the first and the last. And when you turn in the New Testament of your Bible, you'll find that Jesus called himself the Alpha and the Omega, which means the first and the last, the beginning and the ending. So who was it in the Old Testament? that gave his feast, and he said, these are my feast. It was Jesus. He gave them to physical, fleshly Israel. How much do these feasts mean to you? If I were to ask for a show of hands today, and were to say, how many of you have never even heard of the feast of God before? we would probably have a few hands. Then if I were to say, how many of you have accepted Jesus as your Savior and you understand that He has feasts because everywhere in the world that God has a truth, Satan has a counterfeit. And don't we have religious holidays? We have New Year's Day, the beginning of a new year, counterfeiting Jesus, New Year. Then we have April Fool's Day, then we have Halloween, we have Easter, worship to the goddess of heaven. Look up in any dictionary, the word Easter, it'll tell you the two titan goddess of spring. It is not biblical. Then you'll find Christmas, which is nothing more than the Saturnalia and Brumalia, where they worship the sun that the earth orbits around. This is a pagan holiday. It has nothing to do with the birth of Jesus. It was the rebirth of the sun god that the heathen worshipped. So if all these holidays are in the world and we have accepted them as Christian, don't we realize that if they're counterfeits, that there is a truth of the Bible that belongs to Jesus Christ? We should. Well, let's see what Jesus said. What if you were to accept the Feast of God right out of the Bible? And I'm going to prove that they are biblical in the New Testament, not just Old Testament. I'm going to prove it before I'm through. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and verse 33. This is Jesus. If you have a red letter Bible, it'll prove it. Whosoever therefore shall confess me, Jesus the Christ, the Savior, before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, 
Or before, yeah, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Notice what this verse does say and what it does not say. This verse does say that you must confess Jesus before men, before Jesus will profess you before the Father. How do you confess Jesus? Do you just say with your mouth, oh, I believe in Jesus, he's the Savior? No way. No way. I'm going to show a verse in the Bible that says demons confess Jesus and believe on him, but they will not repent and live godly. The only way you can confess Jesus before men is by what you do. It's a big difference. What does repent mean? It means have an amendment of life. You turn away from whatever sin is and you start doing the opposite. If it is a sin, according to 1 John 3, 4, to violate God's law, then you must start obeying it rather than disobeying it. Doesn't that make sense? How can you confess that you are a Christian and all of your sins have been forgiven if you keep living the same lifestyle that made you a sinner to start with? It doesn't even make sense, does it? You confess Jesus by living by every word that He said. That's how you confess Him no other way. In James chapter 2, James chapter 2, very, very interesting statement. You believe that there is one God, you do well. The demons also believe and tremble. But do the demons obey that God? No, they're in rebellion to that God. So what about us? If we believe there is one God and continue in rebellion to His covenant, aren't we still sinners? Yes, we are. We must keep God's covenant, not profess them with our mouth, and then turn around and disobey. We can't do it. It's a complete lifestyle that we live by once we accept Jesus, the true Savior. I don't mean the Jesus that is taught by the world. I mean the real Jesus of this book. The one that says, I came that you can have life and have it abundantly. And the one in the book of Acts, where the Acts of the Apostles says, yes, I profess the way. It is a way of life. Not just professing Jesus and live however you want. Leviticus 23, I'll read verse 4, because remember I did stop and ask a question. How much do these feasts of God mean to you? If they're of Jesus Christ, how much do they mean to you? Now if you've never known of them before, they can't mean much at this point. But how about those of us who've known about them for years and years? How much do they mean to us? After all, if we are to be doers of God's Word and not hearers only, how much do they mean to us? Leviticus 23 verse 4 says, These are the feast of the eternal. And we've already seen that that Lord of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ of the New Testament. Even holy convocations. Look up the word convocation. It's number 4744 in the Strong's Concordance of the Greek language. And it has numbers by each Greek word. And that Greek word for the word convocation means a public assembly. Then when you go on and look it up in the New International Unabridged Dictionary, you'll find Webster's, you'll find that it is like a summons. God puts out a summons since He's the great lawgiver and He summons every Christian to come to His holy days. And they are to be there, which you shall proclaim in their seasons, which we do year after year in this church. Now, in Exodus chapter 13, I want you to see something else. Why is it that the world 
looks around and they can identify someone that they say are God's chosen people. They're called Jews by most people. Why do they say that they're God's chosen people? Two reasons. Number one, they believe in the seventh day of the week as God's Sabbath day, don't they? They stand out like a sore thumb because they keep the sign that God Almighty made, and that's Jesus Christ, in Exodus chapter 31, verse 12 to 18. He said the Sabbath day was to be a sign, and the word sign means a beacon. In other words, it's just standing out. It stand, makes you stand out from the rest of the world. And everybody will know that you're different than they are. Well, look in Exodus 13 here. I'm going to start in verse 6. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and in the seventh day shall be a feast to the Lord. Now, he's already mentioned the first day is a feast of those seven. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. There shall be no leavened bread be seen with you, neither shall there be leaven seen with you in your quarters. That's why every year... When it comes time for the seven days of unleavened bread, we put all the leavened products out of our home and we eat what's called flat bread or unleavened bread because it's biblical. It's one of God's holy days, not one of Satan's counterfeits. Verse 8, And you shall show your son in that day, saying, This is done because of that which the Lord did unto me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall be for a sign. And the word sign is number 226 in the Hebrew language of the Strong's Concordance. And the word sign literally means a beacon, a flag. You run a flag up a flagpole to tell everybody, hey, this is America, this is our flag. When you run the holy days in front of people and you keep them, you're telling them, I have Jesus Christ as my Savior. They don't even know who Jesus is. They've accepted a Jesus of the Catholic Church, which is Mystery Babylon, and they killed all the true believers they could find during the Middle Ages and snuffed out the truth of God. Verse 9. Let's read it again. And it shall be for a sign unto you upon your hand and for a memorial between your eyes that the Lord's law may be in your mouth. I think that's dynamite. This is biblical. This was one holy day out of all of them. A season that God said was a sign that the Lord Jesus Christ's law was in our lifestyle. Because when you profess something with your mouth, it's because of your internal beliefs. What you're thinking inside is what comes out of you. And if you're thinking God's ways, then you'll talk about God's ways. But if you don't know what the Bible says, how can you talk about it? How can you live it? If the churches won't tell you that Jesus Christ was the God of the Old Testament, He had a set of laws and a set of standards, how can you ever keep them? It's a part of the covenant. These holy days that were ratified in blood, looking forward to the time when Jesus Christ would come and make a new covenant, with the same set of laws, but with better promises. I challenge anybody. See, I've already done this. That's why I'm challenging you. I know I can do it. You can look everywhere in the Bible where it talks about the new covenant. You will never find where God says, I'll give you a new set of laws. Never once. He always says, I will write my laws in your heart and mine. The only difference in the Old Testament and the New is that it's based upon better promises and that you have Jesus as the sacrifice instead of animals. In Exodus chapter 24, let's notice briefly that this was a part of the covenant. I've already read it in chapter 23. Now it's going to be ratified with blood. Verse 7 and 8. And he took the book of the covenant, this is Moses, and read in the audience of the people. And they said, All that the Lord, and I'll put in Jesus Christ, has said we will do and be obedient. They were expected to obey it, not just profess it. And Moses took the blood 
and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant, which the Lord Jesus Christ has made with you concerning all these words. So here is a covenant. This is what we term the old covenant. Now let's go to the new covenant. It's prophesied in Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. This is the prophecy. Then we'll go to the New Testament and see what the New Testament says. Jeremiah 31, verse 31 to 34. Behold, the days come, says the Lord Jesus Christ, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, See, it's the same God going to make a different covenant. So he'll be the author of both covenants. Which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, says the eternal. Be but this shall be the covenant, here it is, that I'll make with the house of Israel. After those days, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. Did he say, I will abolish the law? No. Jesus, the very first scripture I gave in Matthew 5, 17 to 19, wanted to make it perfectly clear. He said, I did not come to do away with the law. I didn't come to destroy it. He did say, I will write my law in their inward parts. This is the new covenant. And a part of that covenant was the holy days. We read it in Exodus 23, verse 14 to 17. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They shall teach no, no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. No, because those who are going around knocking on the door saying, Know the Lord today, do not know Jesus. They know His name. But they don't know his doctrines. They don't. Have, they, have you ever heard from one of the churches that you are to keep the holy days of God as a part of the new covenant? Have you ever heard that before? Right here, we're reading it with our own eyes. The prophecy in the new covenant, he would write his same set of laws in their hearts. They didn't have the heart to keep it back then. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. Today, we're going to have the laws of God written into our heart by the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 3.3 3 said He would write it on the tables of our heart and it would be by the Holy Spirit. Well, when God's kingdom comes, then the whole world will keep His holy days. Right here is a prophecy of that time. The word law here, he said, I'll write my law on their heart. In the Hebrew language, the Strong's Concordance, they've assigned the number 8451 to the word law. You can go get your own concordance, Strong's Concordance, look it up. Here's what it means. Torah, specifically the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. That's where God's law is found, the first five books of the Old Testament. That's what Jesus said He's going to write on our heart. If we won't live by them today, how are we going to enter into the kingdom and teach them to people during the thousand-year rule? I mean, after all, don't we hear constantly, even in the secular world, that a good example of parents is what helps bring up their children properly? If you and I aren't an example today and we won't take the sign that we belong to Jesus and that we're keeping His ways and we stand off and apart from the rest of the world. How do we expect Jesus to save us and put us into His kingdom with a new glorified body? How can He trust us to teach His covenant to people during that thousand year reign if we won't even keep it today? Would you, would you trust a bank employee, if you were the president of the bank and you knew that he was a, had been an embezzler at other banks before, and you said, I'll forgive you, don't ever let it happen again. And then you find your bank book doesn't balance. 
and you find out that it was the days when he worked is when it didn't balance. Wouldn't you kind of suspect something? Well, if Jesus said, I'll write my laws into their heart, and then they never keep them, they must not be in their heart. Is that correct? To me, one and one makes two. <laughs> it's simple. Well, let's go to the New Testament. Let's see if God Almighty has written down in the New Testament about His law that He's going to write into our hearts and our minds. Yes, He has. Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Verse 10. And this is a direct quote from the Old Testament. For this is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. I will be a God unto them and they shall be my people. Here in the New Testament, the word laws is number 3551 in the Strong's Concordant. It means the law, especially of Moses, the volume of the books. And which were the books that Moses wrote? The first five books of the Old Testament. That's the law God's going to write into our hearts and our minds if we're serving and obeying Him. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15, I've got a question now. Don't answer except inside of your own mind. Why did Jesus come? You say, well, to die to forgive me of my sins. Okay. What sins? Can you identify them? Can you write them down on paper? What is sin that Jesus came to forgive me for? If you can't write it on paper, you're not sure whether you're forgiven or not because you don't know what sin is. If you cannot identify what sin is, how in the world do you know whether you're forgiven or not? How do you know that you're not still sinning and don't even know it? See? All right, verse 15. Here's why Jesus came. And for this cause, Jesus is the mediator of the New Testament or covenant that by means of death, or he died, for the redemption, the buying back of the transgressions that were under the First Testament. Didn't we just read from the First Testament that the holy days of God were a part of that and it was ratified in blood? Now Jesus came and died to forgive us for breaking the holy days of God. He came and forgave us for breaking God's Sabbath day, which is a part of the Ten Commandments. He spoke from Mount Sinai. If we continue to break them, we continue to live in sin. Because it's a part of the covenant. Jesus came now to forgive us for violating the first covenant. And now He calls it a new covenant. Do you know what the word new means here? Look it up. Double check it. Don't believe me. Go to your own concordance. Look it up with your own eyes. Believe it then. It means refreshing. What is refreshing about this covenant? That we are forgiven because we broke the covenant. Not one of us knew we were to keep God's holy days, did we? Until a certain point when a minister of God preached that we were to keep them. The church is out here. They didn't tell us, did they? Not one of them will tell you. To be exact, they'll argue with you. They'll say, no, they were done away. They were nailed to the cross. We don't keep that old law. And yet, when you look and see what Jesus said He was coming to write in our heart, it was that old law. <laughs> but it was to be with a new spirit, a new attitude. And it was to be because of forgiveness. And now we would keep it with a new attitude of mind, a new desire to serve God. No longer animal sacrifices because Jesus is the one sacrifice. Now we don't just ask for promises of good, healthy children, of rain in due season to produce good crops. No, the physical blessings aren't what we're looking for. Now the promise is eternal life through Jesus for obedience to His covenant. Grace, forgiveness for violating the covenant. Thou now living by the covenant. Grace plus works. That's biblical. Read James chapter 2, the whole chapter. Why was Abraham blessed of God? 
because faith and his works together is what made him the father of the faithful. How does God know that you love him? My Bible says, if you love me, keep my commandments. That ought to tell me that if I don't love him, I won't obey him. What does it tell you? You've got to be honest. You've got to be honest with yourself. I have to be honest with myself. I said I was going to be saying some hard things today, so just bear with me. I'm not through yet. Here it absolutely tells us that when we are forgiven for violating that first covenant, notice now what the good news about the new or refreshing covenant is. They which are called might receive the promise of eternal life. The last part of verse 15. Isn't that what you're looking for? You don't want to die, do you? I don't want to die. Nobody wants to get older and die. We're looking for eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Turn now to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. The Apostle Paul, who knew God's law more than any other apostle, he was in the Sanhedrin. He was sitting at the top of the echelon of that day. Chapter 2, Romans verse 13. For not the hearers of the law are just before God. If you hear my words today and you walk away and they have no meaning to you, you just heard them, you don't live them, you're not justified in God's sight. But the doers of the law shall be justified. Or if you've already accepted the shed blood of Jesus to forgive you for breaking the first covenant, now you're living by it and you're a doer of the law. You remain in a justified or forgiven state. But if you revert back and quit keeping God's covenant, His law, you are no longer justified. You're trampling on the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Notice now the word doer. The number assigned to it in the Strong's Concordance is number 4163. It only has one meaning, not two, not three. There is no way anybody can misunderstand this word. It means performer, like a person on a stage performing for the audience. So now let's read this. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the performers of the law shall remain justified. See? When we know the truth, then we have to live it and never turn back. That's not easy. But with God's help, we can do it. Every one of us. I can see now I've got a two-week message here. I thought it was going to be short, but it's not. I've ad-libbed too much. Now notice that the disciples received God's Holy Spirit before the day of Pentecost. At, uh, John chapter 20, verse 22. Verse 22. And when Jesus had said this, He breathed on them and said unto them, Receive you the Holy Spirit. This was when the disciples received God's Spirit. They now were in the process of conversion. Without God's Spirit, you're not a Christian. With God's Spirit, you are a Christian. Then God's Spirit will lead you into all truth from that day forward. But if you reject truth when it's presented to you, God can take His Holy Spirit from you. And we don't want that to happen. Remember He took it from Saul? And then He gave it to David who replaced Saul as king of Israel. So now the apostles on the day of Pentecost have received God's Spirit. Now let's go and see after the day of Pentecost, did they keep God's holy days? Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. There they were meeting upon the day of Pentecost, and they had already received His Holy Spirit. They continued to keep God's holy days. Why? Because they were Jesus Christ. He gave them to Israel. Now let's notice another very dynamic scripture. 
This is Acts chapter 7 because, let's face it, the book of Acts is a history of the New Testament, the original New Testament. Church. Acts chapter 7. Here's Stephen standing up and he's talking to the elders of Israel. They would stone him for what he said. But notice two very important verses that you and I cannot disregard. Verse 37 and 38. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall you hear. Now this is Jesus that Moses referred to. Notice verse 38 now. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel, so here's Moses and Jesus, which spake to him in Mount Sinai and with our fathers, who Moses received the lively oracles, that's the covenant of God, to give unto us. The history of the Acts of the Apostles is written in the book of Acts. The Apostles continued to keep all of God's holy days and His Sabbath day, all of God's law, except the sacrificial ritualistic system that had to do with the temple worship. Everything else they continued to keep. Notice now in Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. Verse 1 through 3. Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. And he killed James the brother of John with a sword. And because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Why would they mention the days of unleavened bread years later? unless all the New Testament church knew exactly what the time period that when they took James and when they were seeking Peter. Why? Because the New Testament church was keeping those days. So they used the days of unleavened bread under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as a time demarcation so that we would know when they were killing the apostles. Now let's turn to Acts chapter 18. Here's the apostle Paul scattered out on his missionary journeys. Notice verse 21, what he says to the Gentile brethren. He bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that comes in Jerusalem. The feast in Jerusalem. And he wanted to go back and spend it with his brethren back there. Chapter 20 of Acts, verse 6. Paul went over into Macedonia... Notice what he's saying now. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. Why? Because he kept the days of unleavened bread there with the brethren. Then he sailed away from there on his journeys. Let's drop down now the same chapter, verse 16. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia. For he hasted, if it were possible for him to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. Here is a New Testament apostle, and he wanted to keep Pentecost in Jerusalem with the other apostles. Well, let's go on in chapter 21, verse 24. The apostle Paul, once again, is the one that is used in all the churches today to say that God's law was done away, which means the holy days. And the reason why they say they're done away is because they accepted Mystery Babylon the Great's doctrines and their holy days. All right, verse 24. Them taken purify, the apostle Paul was accused of teaching Gentiles they didn't have to keep God's law. Notice what Paul was willing to do to absolutely prove that that was nonsense. That he was teaching all the Gentile churches to keep God's law but not the sacrifices anymore because we have faith in the sacrifice of Jesus, not animals. So there were certain men that had taken a vow and said, we'll not eat until we know the truth of what Paul's teaching. Them take and purify yourself with them and be at charges with them. 
that they may shave their heads and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning you, Paul, are nothing. But that you, Apostle Paul, yourself, also walk orderly and keep the law. Can you get clearer? Paul even shaved his head and took a vow to God Almighty to prove that he still kept the true law of Almighty God. Well, let's go to Acts chapter 27 and see what Paul did when he was in Rome. Acts 27 verse 9. Now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them. What in the world is the fast? The Day of Atonement, one of God's holy days, in the fall of the year. When do we have hurricanes? At the change of the seasons, don't we? In the spring and the fall of the year. And so they didn't want to sail in the Mediterranean because of the upset weather conditions that took place. So Paul told them to wait till after the Day of Atonement before they sailed away. Well, chapter 28 of Acts, verse 17, and then verse 22. Verse 17, And it came to pass that after three days Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing, Against the, against the people or customs of our fathers. Paul committed nothing against God's law. And yet he was brought to Rome to be tried. Verse 22. And here's what the Jews responded to Paul. But we desire to hear of you what you think. For as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it's spoken against. What is a sect? The Christians were a sect of the Jews. Did you know that? They believed in all of God's law. They kept all the Sabbath, the Ten Commandments, the Holy Days. They kept the laws of clean and unclean meat. But they accepted Jesus. That made them a sect, like we call them denominations today. The Jews had denominations. They were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, and now all of a sudden a new denomination sprung up. They were called Christians. They accepted Jesus. And they were right. He was the Savior. He died for their sins. To forgive them for breaking the first covenant, now it was a refreshing new covenant because their sins were forgiven. Now they could keep all of God's law properly from the heart because the Holy Spirit was given to write that law into their heart and their minds. Isn't that neat? How many of us are told that in the churches out there today? No, we're not told those things. Well, I'm going to be at liberty to take just a couple of extra minutes today before we have our potluck. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, this is the Apostle Paul talking to a Gentile church converted from paganism to the law of Almighty God, Jesus Christ our Savior. Verse 7 and 8 of 1 Corinthians 5. Purge out therefore the old leaven. How would they even know the difference in leaven and unleavened bread unless they had been taught by Paul? Purge out therefore the old leaven that you may be a new lump, a new person without sin. As you are unleavened, as you put the leaven out of your home, so you put the sin out of your life. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, look at this now, it's because Jesus has been sacrificed to forgive us of our past law-breaking. Therefore, let us keep the feast. This is New Testament. We are actually commanded by the Apostle Paul, if we accept the sacrifice of Jesus to forgive us of our sins, we're now commanded to keep God's feast days. Why? There is a reason. And that reason is because they explain God's plan of salvation for planet Earth. 
unless you know what the feast days of God are and what they mean, and you're there when the meaning of them is preached upon each time they occur once a year, then how do you know what God's doing on this earth? You don't. People wonder, what's going to happen to all those people that were born before Jesus, that lived in China, Russia, all over the world, never heard the name Jesus? They don't have an answer for it. God's holy days has the answer. All right, look in Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Verse 8 gives the context. Beware lest any man spoil you. These are pagans through philosophy and the vain, vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. The world wants you to keep Christmas, Easter, Halloween. All of them come out of rank paganism. The world does not want you to keep the holy days of God because they teach you the truth as to God's plan of salvation. Christmas doesn't teach you anything except how to lust for more gifts. Halloween doesn't teach you anything except about Satanism and how to dress up like demons and witches and gooses and goblins. Everything evil and dark doesn't teach you about God, does it? No, Easter doesn't either. It teaches you how to worship fertility. Go out and pick up eggs, which is fertilized, and then you have new life. That's what they worship, the queen of heaven, the mother goddess. And little rabbits prolific reproduce. That's why they have rabbits bringing the Easter eggs. Rabbits don't even lay eggs. They give birth live to their little babies. But they're both wrapped up in Babylonian mystery, worship of the goddess of fertility, the queen of heaven, called Easter. So they get our minds off the truth of God and his plan of salvation. Satan counterfeits everything. So let's drop down now to verse 12. Verse 11 and 12 in whom also you are circumcised, this is in Christ Jesus, with the circumcision made without hands, not Old Testament physical circumcision, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. That's the heart. The Holy Spirit changes our mind, our mental attitudes. Verse 12, Buried with Him in baptism, wherein also you are raised with Him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised Jesus from the dead. We believe that when we come out of the watery grave of baptism, all of our past sins are forgiven. Now we're a new person. God gives us His Holy Spirit. Now we can live by all of God's law with a new attitude of mind. Notice what he says now, down in verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Contrary to us. That's the death penalty. Now verse 16 and 17. Let no man, and in context he's talking about those who are preaching paganism. Let no man, no pagan, judge you in meat or drink or in participation in respect of an holy day, your observance of it, or of the new moon, and that's how you tell when to keep the holy days or of the Sabbath day. You're not to let non-believers in the law of God judge you if you keep God's Sabbath day, or if you come and keep His holy days, which picture His plan of salvation. These holy days and the Sabbath, verse 17, are a shadow of things to come. A shadow is prophecy. It's foretelling the future. Who is to tell us what they mean, though? The body of Christ, the church, the ministry that God raises up. Well, I'll refer you to a couple of scriptures if you want to turn to them. One of them is Zechariah 14, 16. When Jesus comes, all the earth will keep His holy days. In Ezekiel 44, verse 23, 24, Ezekiel 45, and verse 17. When Jesus rules during the thousand-year reign, all the world will keep His holy days. Do we expect the church not to do it today? No. Since being baptized for the remission of our sins, have you ever kept God's holy days? Some of you have. Some of you have kept them as long as I have. 
One person I know of in this room has kept them longer than I have. If you have a steady job, if you've had gainful employment, and you have vacation times come coming, you should schedule that around all of God's holy days, especially around the Feast of Tabernacles in the fall of the year when we're told to leave our places of abode and go to a temporary dwelling to learn of God's law. Now, of course, if you haven't learned of them before, you may not have time to get it all together and have the money to go. But if you will read some of the following scriptures, Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 4 through 9, then verse 17 and 18, it tells you when you go to the Feast of Tabernacles, you are to rejoice before God. Why? Because you're learning of His plan of salvation for the rest of the world. And it says you must rejoice. You must leave all your problems behind you and come because it pictures the thousand-year reign of Christ when the whole world is going to be at peace and happiness and joy. So God does not want us to go there with all of our gripes and complaints and murmurings. He wants us to leave them all behind. Then in verse 21 of Deuteronomy 12, it says, if the distance is too far for you to go, too far for you to go where God has the Feast of Tabernacles, then you can stay home, but you must keep it in your own quarters. But brethren, that's only if it's too far. If it's within distance, you must go to the Feast of Tabernacles in the fall of the year. And then verse 32 of Deuteronomy 12 says that if you have the money, you must attend the feast. It doesn't give us a choice. It says you must attend if you have the money. I realize some are on Social Security. Some will be brand new people in the church and will not have had time to save the money from year to year to go to the Feast of Tabernacles. But if you have the money and if you have a year's time, then you must do it. And verse chapter 14 of Deuteronomy tells us why. Verse 22 to 26 says that we can learn to fear the Lord our God, that's Jesus Christ. In John chapter 15, verse 10, it says clearly, if we love Jesus, we will keep His commandments. When we learn the truth, we will begin to adopt those truths in our lives. Brethren, why is it that the world today and I've got three minutes to finish this, then we run out of tape. Why is it the world does not keep God's feast days? Do you know why? Yes, Satan is a deceiver. He has set up what is called Mystery Babylon the Great, a great religious system that snuffed out the truth of the Bible during the Dark Ages, during the Middle Ages. Here's what the Encyclopedia Britannica, the 11th edition, under the article Easter says. It goes through and shows a great controversy between the original disciples that were taught by Jesus personally and the Bishop of Rome. There was a great controversy because those who were taught by Jesus wanted to keep His holy days, the Passover, all of His ways. The church at Rome wanted to adopt paganism. And here is the final solution that the Roman Empire came to. The decision of the council was unanimous that Easter was to be kept on Sunday instead of the Passover and on the same Sunday throughout the world and that none hereafter should follow the blindness of the Jews. In other words, nobody was to obey God Almighty's Bible anymore. They were to come under the religious system of the Roman Empire and they kill for 1260 years anybody that dared obey this book. Will you come out of Babylon and begin to obey God's laws as you learn them? I pray you will.